first day in Poland, so definitely it's up to you to show him the hospitality and excitement that I know that is in this room. Um, there is no other way to show him that by doing a, uh, a lot of noise, uh, asking questions. Um, I'm sure he, he said that he will be here for two days, so uh, you don't have to do a selfie with, uh, with John. Uh, just after his talk, he will be here for two days, so hunt him down uh, <laughs> whenever you want. Um, Okay, so I think that this is the moment for introduction. Um, uh, not many people in the world can say that they have changed the world, uh, not only the world of games, but uh, the enter entertainment as such, uh, a huge influence of, uh, on our culture, uh, incredible story uh, way, back, uh, way back in the history, uh, but having incredible influence on all of you guys, just to check uh, who uh, haven't played uh, Quake, please raise your hands. <laughs> okay, those six people uh, should just grab Wikipedia right now <laughs> and to check uh, what we are talking about. Of course, this is only one of many titles that this person is behind. The huge revolution introducing um, scrolling to the PC games, to the PC, PC world, and then uh, first person shooters that has changed uh, how we perceive entertainment, uh, digital entertainment. Please welcome me on stage, uh, John Romero. Loud applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Need some more chairs back there. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I've been in uh, the game industry for uh, 37 years this year. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> so what I'm gonna talk to you about is probably what you wanna hear about, which is id Software's early days. So um, welcome everybody, I'm John Romero, I'm co-founder of id Software, and I'm gonna take you on a journey back to the beginning of id Software. Are you ready to be entertained? <laughs> All right, I realize that some of what I'm about to say may sound insane, but we were in our 20s and uh, when we started at Software and we didn't know there were any limits. So I, I grew up in a wonderful small town in Northern California named Rockland, which had a population of 6,000 people. In the 1970s, <laughs> I was massively addicted to spending loads of time in dark arcades and playing all the games there and getting really good at them. So in 1979, before anybody had a computer at home, including me, I used to go to the college uh, starting at age 11. I started learning basic from college students there. I just went up to them and I just asked them what the words were on their, uh, on their screens. <laughs> and I wrote them all down and uh, just experimented with them uh, on this uh, mainframe that was called an HP 9000 that filled up the next room. So to, uh, to keep me at home and out of the college, uh, my parents got an Apple II Plus, <laughs> that computer there. So uh, after getting the computer at home, I was done going outside. So I spent all my time programming games on that computer. So a few years and about 20 Apple II games later, I finally learned 6502 assembly language, the language that all fast arcade games are written in. Then I could really make 80s games like these, except not quite. Uh, I made computer games, so <laughs> I made them at home on my Apple II. Uh, let's just say that the Apple II was my personal home arcade as well as probably one million other Apple owners at the time. So when I was a sophomore in high school, that's um, grade 10, uh, I did some programming for the Air Force when I was 15 years old. I can't tell you what I was programming because it's classified. <laughs> After high school, I kept making games, and by 1987, I got my first job at Origin Systems. Uh, the job was porting this RPG called 2400 AD from the Apple II to the Commodore 64. Has anyone heard of this game? Probably not, yeah. <laughs> By this time, I'd made uh, 74 games and three startup companies, and uh, they're called Capital Ideas Software, 
uh, Inside Out software where I ported Might and Magic 2 to the Commodore 64 and Ideas from the Deep. And at the time I was 21 years old. I went to work at a company named Softdisk at the start of 1989. I learned how to program a DOS PC there for the first time and I made a small game or a utility every single month for about a year. I had to ship every month. Then I created a game product called Gamer's Edge at Softdisk and I had to hire a team of game developers. So I hired John Carmack and Adrian Carmack, who are not related, into my department for programming and art. Tom Hall came in at night to help us out since he was already at Softdisk and he loved making games. So this was the first time that any of us had worked together with any other person on a game after we'd been making games alone for ourselves for 10 years each. It was incredible. So while creating our first game together, which was called Slordax, John Carmack discovered the smooth scrolling trick on the PC. Tom Hall and John stayed up until 5 a.m. making a demo called Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. Have you heard of this? <laughs> um, the next day, uh, I saw a disc on my, key, on my desk and I ran the demo on it and I watched the screen scroll smoothly pixel by pixel and it was a massive eureka moment for me. It was like a bolt of lightning. I'll elaborate why uh, in a moment. Its software was born that instant on September 20th of 1990. One thing led to another and we spent a week putting together a demo of Super Mario 3 for Nintendo, which they liked, but they decided not to publish because they decided to only publish their games on their NES platform, which was a smart move at the time. That's no problem, we just used the technology for a different game called Commander Keen. Has anyone heard of Commander Keen? Yeah, all right. S smooth scrolling on the PC. So why would a side scroller be a huge hit on PCs in 1990? Well, because no games on the PC could scroll s horizontally, smoothly, per pixel. At the time, the PC had been out since August of 1981, but in nine years, no one had figured out how to make the screen scroll smoothly per pixel until the Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement demo which led to Commander Keen. So does anyone remember uh, the original Duke Nukem game pictured here on the bottom left? Side scrolling? Um, so it scrolled by chunks of eight pixels uh, like the other games of that era. And the, uh, the reason why Duke Nukem scrolled at all with any speed <laughs> is because I taught Todd Replogel how to do it while he was coding a game called Dark Ages which just came before Duke Nukem. Then he learned how to do the smooth scrolling from Commander Keen. So the Commander Keen trilogy provided the start of our company and we made these, game, these three games, the original trilogy, we made them in three months from September 20th to December 14th of 1990 and we did it in our spare time. So it was a massive hit for us and it was so popular that people cosplayed as, as Keen at lots of events over the years. Some of these are recent pictures. <laughs> um, the game, Commander Keen, pioneered the creation of game engines. So we designed the game as an engine that operated on different data for different games. It was the only way to get the, the, the trilogy done so quickly. In fact, in 1991, when we were working on Keen 4, we started licensing the engine for the first time. It was the beginning of the modern engine licensing business. Uh, development in our games went very smoothly and quickly because we stuck to some core principles that are important even today. Through this talk, I'll highlight some of our core principles. Is anyone a programmer here? All right, good. Good number of programmers. This is a good programming talk. <laughs> um, so I'd like to highlight something else right now, namely this photo. Has anybody seen this photo before? No, okay. Um, it's a picture of us at the lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana when we started working on, on uh, Commander Keen. Actually, this is a little earlier than that. The funny thing is people have asked me for years what was in this picture, so I guess it's uh, more popular in the United States. 
Um, so I analyzed the picture recently, and in the picture, this is kind of what you see. This is John and me in uh, early September of 1990. We were working on the Super Mario 3 demo that we planned on sending to Nintendo. We both worked on this huge Dungeons and Dragons table that John had. We used to play D&D on the weekends, and those sessions led to the ideas for future games like Doom and Quake. Okay, so Tom Halt, you know, <laughs> let's see, Tom Halt took the photo. Um, the computers uh, were brought home from work on the weekends, <laughs> from work. Uh, so this picture was taken on a Saturday or a Sunday. On top of the monitor is one of those old Intel reflective astronaut plushies. You may not remember them. Uh, to my left is a notepad, which I used as a task list of bugs to fix. This is our high-level task list of what we had to get done to finish the demo. It was a whiteboard. Um, and this is Tom Hall's area where he was doing all the graphics for the demo. He recorded gameplay on a VCR and he played it back, pausing the action so he could duplicate the tiles exactly in Deluxe Paint 2. And the TV set is, uh, had an old, uh, it was an old TV set. It had a 13 channel selector on it and it was connected by an RF modulator on the back. It was very old school. So id Software was formally founded on February 1st, 1991. <clears throat> we made te uh, 12 games that year. Shadow Knights, Dangerous Dave in the Haunted Mansion, Rescue Rover, Hover Tank, etc. 12 games. We actually took two months per game, but we made two games simultaneously. This was due to us having 10 years of intense game development experience prior. But it was also due to our first principle. No prototypes, just make the game. Polish as you go, don't depend on polish happening later. Always maintain constantly shippable code. This is how we made so many games so quickly. We had the entire game in our heads. We knew what we were gonna make. We just needed to quantify what needed to be done and we went about working on it until the game was finished. There were no prototypes for our games. We just made them. Remember, we had a small team of four people and we could do this. Large teams definitely require more planning. So time for a quick story. One day it rained really hard and Cross Lake in Louisiana rose and it was flooding everywhere. I needed to get to work. We're furiously working away on our games and I had to get back into it. So I just got ready and went down the street and then I saw this. The entire road was flooded. <clears throat> so basically I waded through the huge flood and water snakes all the way to the house and I took another shower and I got back to work. And it was because we're so excited to be making our own games 24-7. Also note that during the year of 12 games, we moved id Software from Louisiana to Wisconsin, and that takes a lot of time out of game development. So we couldn't afford to have anything go wrong while we were making our games at such a crazy pace. So we created another principle that kept us developing quickly. It's incredibly important that your game can always be run by your team. Bulletproof your engine by providing defaults upon load failure. If you have 100 people trying to develop a game that will not run, you're paying for 100 people to sit around and wait for it to get fixed. So we recognize the importance of keeping the game always playable, and we decided to bulletproof our engine by making all input solid. So game engines typically fail because they're trying to load bad corrupted or non-existent data. So checking for this and providing a default for a failure case will keep the game running and quickly show you what's missing. So if you fail to load a sprite, just show a bagel. If the theme song isn't loading, play something obviously wrong for your game. That missing sound effect, same thing. So after 1991, id Software's first stage of company development was complete and another important principle was in effect. Keep your code absolutely simple. So keep looking at your functions and figure out how you can simplify further. We wrote all of our games up to and including Quake in plain C, not C++. Okay, so stage two was about to begin. In August of 1991, we decided to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Tom Hall and I visited Madison at the time and we found it to be really nice since Tom used to live there while he was in college. We moved all four of us up there and continued to work on our games. 
Only four months later, we were found dead in the snow, victims of Wisconsin's brutal winters that we did not research. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, you know, do your research. <clears throat> we knew how to program an assembly language, but not how to ask Tom Hall, hey, what are winters like up here? So after six months, we'd had enough and we moved down to Texas. So we had a new principle. Great tools help us make great games. So spend as much time on tools as possible. I wrote a tile editor in 1991 that was named Ted for tile editor. And Ted was used for 33 shipped retail games, several of which were even 3D games like Hover Tank, Catacomb 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, Spirit Destiny, Rise of the Triad, Corridor 7, etc. So it was January of 92, we decided to go all 3D based on Catacomb 3D's promise. It looked cool, but it just didn't play cool. So Wolfenstein, 3, Wolfenstein 3D took us four months of development time to get it to its shareware launch. And uh, that's with one episode of levels. So it took two more months to finish all six episodes and the hint book. And the first month it sold 4,000 copies, all priced at $60 each. Spirit Destiny took two months and it's a prequel to Wolfenstein 3D, and uh, it was retail only. So soon after that, Tom Hall traveled to Kentucky to work for a couple months on Wolfenstein VR. Yes, this was 1992 VR. Not so cool. <laughs> Back in the days of Commander Keen, I had discovered a small three-person game company called Raven Software in Madison. I called them up, we went over and introduced ourselves. So flash forward seven months later, and we did a little work with them by modifying the Wolfenstein 3D engine and licensing it to them for a game called Shadowcaster. Shadowcaster's tech improvements were sloping floors, lighting, and fog. This engine looked slightly better than Wolfenstein 3D, but it wasn't good enough for our next game. So John Carmack, he took, spent some months thinking about how more advanced the new engine would be for the game that we decided to call Doom. Based on the rapid development of our previous games, we came up with another important principle. We are our own best testing team and should never allow anyone else to experience bugs or see the game crash. So don't waste others' time. Test thoroughly before checking in your code. No throwing it over the fence for testers to find. Put, in a bu put a bug in a database, then fix it later. It's a wasteful cycle. We wrote the bugs, we can fix them faster. So after 1992, its software's second stage of company development was complete, along with another principle. As soon as you see a bug, you fix it. <laughs> Do not continue on. If you don't fix your bugs, your new code will be built on a buggy code base and ensure an unstable foundation. If you check in buggy code, someone will be writing code based on your bad code, and you can just imagine how wasteful that can be. So the ideas for Doom came from our D&D campaign, which was full of demons. <laughs> we also love the movies Evil Dead and Aliens. Doom's design was a mashup of ideas. At the beginning of Doom's development, we created a new core principle. Use a superior development system than your target to develop your game. Before Doom, we were making games for DOS while we were developing on DOS computers. We knew we could do better if we used more powerful computers and a more advanced operating system to develop our games. So we developed Doom on Next Step workstations. They were far superior to DOS. Next Step eventually turned into OS X or OS X. This also meant that one of our core principles was upheld. Great tools help make great games. We could make far better tools on Next Step. Doom Ed and Quake Ed were two of the most important tools that we had. And they both really helped us create levels and test them very quickly. So you might not have known this, <laughs> but we had five people on our team creating Doom. That's everybody who was making Doom. Uh, after Tom Hall left halfway through Doom, we hired Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor, which brought us up to six people total when we shipped Doom. We also did the Super Nintendo port of Wolfenstein 3D right in the middle of Doom's development. So we had to stop making Doom. 
Uh, it took us three weeks to do this port because we had to learn the Super Nintendo hardware. So we, we uploaded the shareware version of Doom to the University of Wisconsin server on December 10th, 1993. The excitement for the game was unprecedented. People were creating files in the upload directory that were sentences like when.will.we.c.doom. We got random phone calls in the office asking when it would be out. So time for a quick story. During the final day of Doom's creation, we worked 30 hours that day. We had the game running on all the computers in the office to ensure it was solid. However, on a couple computers, the game froze. The menu could be brought up, but the gameplay stopped. John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening, and he figured out the solution without doing any debugging. He was correct in his solution, and we finally uploaded after the five-minute fix and more testing on our computers. At the beginning of 1994, I started working with Raven Software and developed Heretic using the Doom engine. I wanted to see how an inventory system in a medieval version of Doom would play. It turned out pretty great. Does anyone here remember Heretic? Yeah. All right. Chicken deathmatch is pretty fun. We also made Doom 2 in 1994 over eight months, and it was released on October 10th. In addition to this, we did the Jaguar Doom port ourselves. Again, we were multitasking and making multiple games, so two games in 1993 and three games in 1994. In 1995, we started working on Quake. We had nine developers in the company. There were four designers, three coders, and two artists, and I was the only person to do both coding and design. I wrote QuakeEd and experimented with level design in full 3D. Again, we started with a clean code base. No code from Doom was used in Quake which was another one of our core principles of development back then. Write your code for this game only, not for a future game. You're going to be writing new code later because you'll be smarter. Also, you're not tying yourself down to the limitations of your past code, so get used to inventing new things. Quake's engine was being developed by John Carmack, and the rasterization was by Michael Abrash. John Cash worked on the network code, and he went on to become the lead programmer of World of Warcraft. Time for another quick story. <clears throat> this relates back to our belief that developing in a superior operating system can result in a better game. While making Quake, we had a deal with Cray Supercomputers to buy a Cray YMP for half price. Our plan was to have our development team connected to it for BSP to BSP and light our maps as well as crunch whatever new kinds of data we would create with our new game's engine. So the computer room in Quake's DM3 level was going to be full of Cray computers as a reference to this new hardware we were going to acquire. Unfortunately, Cray was bought by Silicon Graphics before Quake was done, and the deal fell apart. So the computer room in Quake is filled with the usual rectangular mainframes instead of C-shaped Cray computers. After publishing Heretic, I started working with Raven on Hexen. I wanted to see how an FPS would play with a hub level system and character classes. It, uh, does anyone remember Hexen here? Yeah? All right. Hexen launched on October 30th of 1995 during the Deathmatch 95 event that was happening at Microsoft in Redmond. So a month later, I got Raven started on my next game design, which was called Hecatome. It would be the third game in the series, Heretic, Hex, Hexen, and Hecatome. Hecatome was never finished. It was turned into Hexen 2. So during this time, we noticed a small game company making some nice games like Raptor, Call of the Shadows, and we brought them down from Illinois to make a game that we would publish, and they called themselves Rogue Entertainment, and about 14 months later released Strife, which used the Doom engine. It was an FPS RPG, and it was really fun. It showed the combining genres could actually make a fun FPS. Now, has anyone here seen Strife? Yeah, a few people. It's, it's available on Steam, but it was a very hard to find game, even in the US. So during 90, 1995, we created Ultimate Doom, which was a retail version of the full Doom with an extra episode. And we also created the master's levels of Doom in 1995. So its software was still nine developers in size. We released two games in 1995 while we're making Quake. So work continued on Quake 
and 14 months after starting, we released Q-Test on February 22nd, 1996, about 20 years ago. Uh, and this was for the world to test our internet gameplay. So during the next four months, we worked very hard to complete Quake. We also released Final Doom, which was created by Team TNT and the Casali brothers, and Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, which was an additional set of levels for Hexen. So one important principle that helped us get Quake done faster was this. Encapsulate functionality to ensure design consistency. Examples of this in Quake would be the torches on the walls, as a simple example. We could have made the level designers place a torch model, then a fire model, then animated, then a torch sound entity, all at the same location, but then if we needed to move a lot of stuff around, something could have gotten left behind. So it's far easier to just create a torch entity that had all the functionality built in. Also, water in the game needed sound effects entities all over the place to fully cover all the water areas so you'd hear it everywhere. If water got modified in the level, moving all those entities around <laughs> would have been a big mess. So it was easier to make the game play the water sounds whenever water was being rendered on the screen. So it was a renderer level feature and it was out of designer's hands. So it ensured consistency and it saved memory. And we did the same thing for the sky audio in Quake. So I released Quake shareware on June 22nd at 5.30 p.m. Central Time on the University of Wisconsin at Madison's site. So time for a quick story. While Michael Abrash was programming the renderer for Quake, he was interleaving CPU instructions with FPU instructions to calculate perspective correct texture mapping. Sometimes while he was playing the game, for one frame, the game would show a completely different part of the map. He isolated the only instruction where that could happen and he determined that it was impossible for it to be an invalid value. He had a friend from Intel come over and go through his analysis and his friend agreed with him and then told him that there was a known error with the floating point divide instruction on the Pentium. It was a hardware error. So there was nothing that we could do about it, so we just left it alone. This bug is known as the Pentium FDiv bug. You can look it up. So Quake is the game that introduced the world to mouse look and uh, high-speed, true 3D world and internet multiplayer. I think you're all familiar with Quake and internet multiplayer. <laughs> so clans sprung up immediately, as did eSports, and tournaments started happening everywhere. And Quake World was launched five months later after we released Quake. So making games was and still is our life. Like we love it more than anything else, as you can tell by our release of 28 games in five and a half years by less than 10 people. Many other games were released that used our licensed technology over the years. So here are some more core examples or core principles that we learned from all of this work. Try to code transparently. Tell your leads and peers exactly how you are going to solve your current task and get feedback and advice before starting. Do not treat game programming like each coder is a black box of knowledge. The project could go off the rails and cause delays. And programming is a creative art form based in logic. Every programmer is different and will code differently. Don't waste time focusing on a rigid coding style. It's the output that matters. So we keep making, we keep working to make great games. It's in our blood as it's in all of your blood. It's why you're here at Digital Dragons and you wanna be the best, so go be the best. Thank you for your time and I'll be in the indie hall to check out your games. Thanks a lot. Okay, thankfully we have still some time, so now this is the moment for your questions. Uh, who wants to start? Okay, it's gonna a pass a microphone around. <laughs> How much time it, it takes to grow these hairs? <laughs> how, much, uh, how much time? How much time did you need to grow the hair? You have? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah usually uh, three years. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, there, oh, by the way, the reason why my uh, my uh, my hair is uh, long and stays long is because I'm uh, part Yaqui, uh, Native American, and Cherokee, and Mexican. So <laughs> they evidently keep their hair. 
Okay, we have a question here. Okay. Uh, hello, John. Thank you very much for your talk. I wanted to uh, ask you, have you played the new Doom? And when do you think about it? I haven't played it yet, um, but I'm going to be playing it. And so far, the reviews sound pretty great. Um, I know that people were, were a little, you know, mixed on the, um, the beta, the open beta of multiplayer, but people that have been get getting into the single player have started finding it to be totally different, and they are really loving it. So I'm, I'm excited to, to check it out. Okay, could you come closer, just <laughs> not to waste time for... <laughs> you have to walk up to the front. Hi, um, you recently announced uh, your new thing. What do you see as the biggest challenge? Uh, with Black Room? My new game? Yeah. The biggest challenge uh, with Black Room is probably right now it's just to make a, a, a cool playable demo of, you know, of gameplay that we can show in a video to get people excited about it. So we launched a Kickstarter and we didn't show video much like a lot of other games. In fact, I think the, the biggest uh, Kickstarter uh, game that was like 5.5 million, I think, um, it didn't have a gameplay video. And so uh, I worked with four different companies and we all agreed that the pitch that, that we had should have been good enough. Um, but as soon as people started saying, hey, we need to see some gameplay video, we, it was only after a few days, we just took down the campaign and said, all right, we'll make a gameplay video. So, um, so we're doing that in Unreal, uh, Unreal 4. So however long it takes us to get a really cool looking demo uh, then we'll make a really cool video and show people what Black Room is all about. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you come closer? Hello. Um, I have one question. Uh, why not look up and look down in Doom? Uh, was there a technical constraint or you just didn't consider this uh, a valuable feature at the time? Well, um, so while making Doom, you know, we had just gotten past Wolfenstein, and Wolfenstein used, uh, you know, ray, ray casting techniques to, to, to render the world, and then Doom used a different technique to, you know, using BSPs to render the, the scene, and to make the scene render quickly, we had to keep the walls straight, and that meant that we couldn't have a true 3D engine where you could, ro where you could you know, look straight down or look up. That would have meant angles. So to, to make the engine go really fast, you got to remember back then, people had 386 machines. And so it had to go really fast. Luckily, BSPs helped us with that. But um, we didn't look up and down uh, because of speed reasons and just because it was hard enough trying to make the Doom engine uh, look really great, even with the, the optimizations that we had. Then... Um, in Heretic, we ha had uh, what's called shearing. It was like looking up and down, except it really just showed more of a, the top and bottom of the same scene. And, uh, and we didn't put that in Doom because we didn't have the idea of putting it in Doom <laughs> at the time. But while making Heretic, uh, decided to put that in there, and then we could have, a, you know, um, we could have the wings of wrath, which let you kind of fly around and stuff. Um, so we didn't put it, we didn't put it in, in Heretic because we didn't have the idea. We probably wouldn't have done it anyways because we let the player auto-aim vertically uh, since the game was 2D, really, from top down. Um, we could help the player by just, you know, sh hit the monster anyway, no matter where no matter where he's at vertically. So that's why. <laughs> okay, we, we have a few questions here, so... Uh, how did you invent... Well, was it designed or were rocket jumps just, you know, an accident? <laughs> rocket jumps were an accident. <laughs> so the funny thing is in, uh, in Doom, uh, does, well, you remember Doom, so E3 M6, which was called Mount Erebus, the level, um, it was like an outdoor level. It was one of the only full outdoor levels in Doom. And each of the episodes in Doom had a secret level. And the only way to get to the secret level from that level was to rocket yourself backwards off of a wall. So you had to be full health, you know, full armor, and then shoot a rocket into a wall. So you're not really jumping, but you were like rocket blasting yourself back into a little area where you could press a button and go to the secret level. So that was the first time we used, we actually made the player have to use a rocket to move somewhere. 
Uh, but then while making Quake, for some reason, uh, we never thought of hurting ourselves by shooting at the floor. <laughs> it just didn't seem logical to us. But, uh, you know, getting red armor and, uh, in, uh, you, know, qu you know, grenade and rocket jumping combos and stuff is, it's insane. We wouldn't have designed the levels in Quake to be the way that they were if we knew that rocket jumping was a real thing because you can finish some of those levels in seconds. Like uh, episode two, level one, probably takes about 15 minutes if you're really good, but with rocket jumping, it's 11 seconds. <laughs> so yeah, we did not know about it. Okay. What version control system did you use in the 90s? Which key controls? Uh, version control. Oh, version, version control? Yeah, version control. <laughs> yeah, version control. We had floppies. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically how, you know, at the very beginning, we didn't even have a network. So we were copying um, the way that we worked together before networks even was uh, each of us would be programming on our computer and then we would copy our source files onto our own, our own disks that we usually drew pictures and stuff on and then hand it to everybody and then they just copied those source files over the old ones on their computer so we owned our own source files so no one else would modify them because there was no such thing as merging or anything. So, um, so yeah, so all those games um, I programmed and John programmed to get, you know, basically both of us coded all those games and uh, m there was no merging, it was it was basically copying stuff on a floppy and we just passed floppies back and forth. And then when we did have a, a network, which was actually during Doom and Quake and Heretic and Hex and all that, there was no source control. So um, we would make a backup directory and then just copy stuff into a backup directory. So yes, you can make a game like Quake with no source control. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, so you've showed us some principles of the team of the time. Um, do you think they all still apply? And if no, which ones? I'm asking especially in regards to the testing principles. Um, yeah, so the funny thing is that I think the testing principles are absolutely still valid today. Um, a lot of companies, when you start investing in a QA team and you really start building it up, you're kind of telling everybody, oh, yeah, you can just throw your bugs over to those guys. Um, if you don't have a testing team, like we never had a tester at id Software, um, we basically ran the game and if we found something wrong, we fixed it. We did it. You know, that's, that's, how we <laughs> that's how we ship games that had you know, very few bugs and the bugs that were in the game were bugs that we couldn't find from normal gameplay. Um, so we fixed everything that we saw. It was every, every little bitty thing, we fixed it immediately. And, uh, and then gave it to everybody and we would play it and, and uh, you know, keep on coding. So um, even nowadays, we do the same thing. You know, especially if you're making a small indie game, you, know, you don't really need testers, you just need to play your own game. Just play it over and over and over again and, and try, try to actually break it. Uh, most programmers don't want their code to break so they kind of avoid it, but you have to do the opposite. You have to ruin your code. Okay, so last, uh, let's say two questions. So Doom modding scene is still very active after all these years. Uh, how much do you follow it and how much does it influence you as a game maker? Uh, the, Goom, the Doom community is, um, you know, it's been around for a long time. Doomworld.com is a really great site where just, you know, these people have been around for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the cool thing is they've modified, you know, the source ports of Doom are almost at Quake level right now. Like they can do angles and, and uh, crazy GL effects and everything. Um, so it's, you know, the only way that you can kind of tell a Doom level from a Quake, you know, original Quake level is that there's sprites. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the Doom World, you know, the stuff that people are doing on Doom World is, n is influential on me as just current games are. Uh, but there are some neat, there's some really good gameplay still. Um, people have modified the original game, um, but they haven't you know ruined the original game. So they've done a lot of good modifications to to kind of show this is what I want. You know, uh, if anybody has has seen Brutal Doom, um, I can't even imagine ship, having shipped Doom like that when it came out. We probably would have been destroyed. 
think people would have gone nuts if we just if we had shipped Brutal Doom back in 1993. Uh, but it's if you guys haven't seen Brutal Doom, it's uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube and it's insane. Um, but I love I love it. I love Brutal Doom. But uh, but yeah, it doesn't have a, too much of a big impact on uh, like current stuff. Other than there's really good bounce in the game. Uh, you know, I mean, the original Doom has a has an influence, but not so much all of the mods. So there is a book about the early days of each software. It's called Master of Doom. How accurate do you think the book is? Uh, so Masters of Doom, everything in that book's accurate. And John and I had to sign a release for the publishing company to, to let them know we would sue them for whatever was in the book. Um, so everything in that book is totally real. Uh, it all happened. In fact, way more stuff than that happened that was in the book. But there just was so many pages that you could get information in. So there's a ton of detail um, to all of those stories. But that he could only, David could only write so much of it. But it was all real. It was all true stuff. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I will just use people who didn't have the opportunity yet. I would like to ask you, how much time takes you uh, testing your own game? Is it about 10% of your old work or 20? Or you are just playing so long, then uh, you will think that, okay, it's okay, I found a bug or everything is okay. Yeah, I spend tons of time playing my stuff. In fact, um, <coughs> I, re I released two Doom maps for the original Doom within the last few months. And uh, those maps I played, you know, at least a thousand times uh, while making them. So I would, I would draw a few lines, do just a little bit of stuff, and then I'd run it. Because I can do it within seconds, I can be running the map in that area. And, uh, and it lets me know if like, the size is right, if what I'm doing is, is, is feeling OK. And then I know to go from there instead of doing a whole bunch of work and finding out I need to destroy a lot of it because the size is wrong or something, something else is wrong with it. And I basically, we, we program the exact same way where we will only code for maybe five minutes before we test our code. Um, and that basically means that debugging is very quick because we know what we did within the last five minutes. It's obvious. It's not like I just programmed for an hour and something is wrong and who knows, it could be a cascading list of wrong. So instead of coding for an hour and then trying to figure it out with crazy line, you know, line by line debugging, code for five minutes, do a few lines and, and test it immediately. And if something's wrong, it's because you just wrote it. It's really easy to find. And we've been doing that since the very beginning. And, and the reason why is because there were no debuggers at the very beginning. So if something broke, you had to guess what it was. And the smartest way to do that is to write a few lines of code and then test it. So um, if you keep doing that nowadays, you'll find your debugging time goes way down when you've only coded for a few minutes. And so I do the same thing with levels and with, with everything else. Test, test, test. Most of your time, if you can spend most of your time playing your game, you're doing a good thing. Hey, John, uh, what's the most unusual device Doom runs on? What was that, the most? Unusual device Doom runs oh, on. Oh, geez, what's the most unusual? I actually had a, uh, had a video um, that ran for a while that had Doom running on every, everything I could find. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe a printer screen. Uh, have you guys heard of Doom running on a printer, little printer LCD? Uh, and, that, and it's funny that, that it runs on that because it was a security person who was trying to test if he could hack into a printer over a network. And to show them that he could do that, he wiped out the, the, the memory on that printer and put Doom on it. So when they would try to print, it just had Doom up on it. Um, and uh, I think people got Doom run, uh, on an Apple Watch, I think. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's run on anything pretty much with a, a display. <laughs> Even old computers, people have gone back and made Doom on the, you know, Timex Sinclairs and stuff. Um, okay, I will, uh, first of all, I, I, I need to uh, get you here in the middle of the stage you have hidden here. All right. Um, and I want to all photographers and people to have opportunity to take a proper picture of you on the Disney right. Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is, I wanted to ask, um, 
uh, what would be your advice for a, a beginning uh, game developers? So, uh, uh, is there any advice how to start or? Uh, yes, I have great advice. <laughs> um, so, uh, how many of you are artists that do pixel art or, yeah. So, um, you might not know it, but programming is really easy, actually. Um, and I've talked to several artists who were excited about, you know, the fact that you can actually draw your own art for your game, but you just need to get your game running. Um, getting into game programming, you want to you get in kind of easy. And uh, I would recommend if you're starting out to, to write 2D games. Um, and to start doing 2D games, I would recommend using a, an SDK called Corona SDK. It's from coronalabs.com. And it uses a language called Lua, which is C-based, but it's simpler than C is. And, um, and you can make games uh, extremely quickly. You can get graphics up on the screen in one line. You know, you add two monsters, two more lines. Um, but it's a full operate. It's a full programming language. It's not like an environment that takes your your control away. You basically decide how you're going to construct your game. But it has lots of tools for making uh, really cool stuff. So download uh, Corona SDK and go to uh, Lua.org. Um, it'll kind of show you how to program a little bit. And Corona's site has lots of tutorials on how to implement their SDK. And I mean, they do everything, networking, you name it, particle effect systems, all everything. It's a good tip. Um, the second question is, when you gather a team, um, there are different approaches. So you need a programmer, graphic designer, someone who understands the business, publishing, or something like that. Um, uh, who would you, you know, um, Recruit like spend the um, uh, most time recruiting. So who is the who is the most important person right now? To, the most difficult one to find on the market, uh, from your side. Like, uh, what competence is you know the rarest? Probably a really good game designer. Okay. Uh, the, the the design of a game is more important than any other part of it. Uh, you could be spending years making a really awful game because somebody had a really bad design, and you could be the best programmer in the world, and no one would know because you just made a really awful game. But you could be a good programmer with an amazing idea, and you could make Minecraft, and you could change the whole industry. Yeah, it's true. OK, so the, the last third question is um, VR, mobile platforms. Uh, people are saying about uh, multiple opportunities. Uh, you said about crowdfunding, Kickstarter. By the way, on this stage today, we'll have a super hot, uh, one of the most um, famous Polish games on Kickstarter. Um, so. Where do you see the biggest op business opportunity in games industry? So, still platforms, VR, or what? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it just makes uh, the opportunities just keep on expanding every year. You know, the game business keeps growing every single year. It's over a hundred billion dollar year industry, um, and the more opportunities that there are, like VR and other uh, other input or output methods, uh, just ensures that people can get into all other areas of it. So um, mobile's huge, you know. It's a lot about marketing, really, um, and getting your your stuff out there. As a as a um, as as advice for people who want your name to be known or you want your game to be known, the best thing you can do is make a really good game and start submitting it to indie contests like here and IGF and indie you know indie um, indie games in in California, the Indiecade. Uh, but get your game out there. And if people like it and they nominate you, you get free press. And then if you win, you get even more press. But you need to make a good game, and then you need to just get it out there for people to see. And these these kinds of events are great for that. This is a good good advice. Yeah, get out of the, get out of the room, show your game to other people. Um, okay, I think that this is our time. Uh, the next talk will start in ten minutes. It will be Ed Fries, the creator of Xbox and Microsoft Game Studios. Uh, Ed Fries. Ed Fries, <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, so this will be also exciting, but right now I wanted to ask you to give uh, loud thanks to John Romero. Thanks a lot. <laughs>